what, what's this all about? Well, I think many of you know that there are two forms of myotonic dystrophy, DM type 1 and DM type 2, and that the mutation that causes DM1 is different to that that causes DM2. But both cases, there are similar molecular events that lead to the disease phenotype, and these are a consequence of the, the mutation that's present in both types of patient. And essentially, oh dear, it's got one of those timing things, I'll have to. Um, essentially, what um, happens is that the DM1 mutation is uh, what's called a tetranucleotide repeat. Sorry, the DM2 mutation is a tetranucleotide repeat with four base pairs of DNA which become expanded. And the DM1 mutation is a triplet repeat with three base pairs which become hugely increased in size in uh, patients. And that it's somehow something to do with this additional material, additional genetic material, which leads to the condition. In both cases, however, the mutation leads to some distinct structures or spots that can be identified in patient cells in the laboratory, and that those spots are something which, which provide a sort of flag or target for us in our attempts to develop therapies for DM. Now, just to put this more into context, I've got two or three slides which are basic slides about biology, which explain a little bit about the cell and the nucleus and the cytoplasm and DNA and RNA and protein. You don't have to remember this, but these are the key components. So a cell is pretty much like a fried egg. And in the middle of the fried egg, you have the yolk. And that is, for a cell, the nucleus. And the egg white is the cytoplasm. And the DNA, which is on your chromosomes, is present in the nucleus. And the DNA is then, is then read, the message in the DNA is read in another molecule called RNA. And the RNA travels from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where it's made into protein. And it's important that the RNA is able to move from the nucleus into the cytoplasm for this to take place. So what happens in DM1? Well, so cells are the same. They have a nucleus and they have a cytoplasm. And the DNA is present in the nucleus. But for the mutant gene, for the faulty gene, it produces an RNA which does not escape from the nucleus. And when it's present in the nucleus, it aggregates into spots or foci, and that these spots or foci seem to attract other things within the cell that start to create a general malfunction. OK, so that's the nucleus and the cytoplasm and DNA, RNA, and protein. Now, this is the sort of iconic structure of a double-stranded DNA helix. And the thing you see on the right is an opened-up version of the double helix. And essentially, there are really two parts to consider. There are these parts here, which are, 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 are like the supports of the ladder. And this is a phosphate sugar backbone. And then there are these bits in the middle, which are bases 
which are paired in DNA. And in myotonic dystrophy, there are three bases, which are CTG, and the, the three bases are present in hundreds or thousands of copies, where they should be present in single number or tens of copies. So DNA is a double-stranded structure, whereas RNA, which is read from the DNA, is a single-stranded structure. So you still have this backbone, but rather than having two bases here in a paired structure, you have a single-stranded structure. And the idea behind oligotherapy is to use a short, single-stranded structure that targets the faulty RNA. So in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a, a, a short sequence of 20 or so base pairs is used to create a bridge which effectively jumps over the mutation in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In myotonic dystrophy, it's hoped that we can design oligonucleotides that will target specifically the faulty RNA present in patient cells. Okay? Everybody got that so far? So, in the last couple of years, there have been two publications in scientific journals from groups in Charles Thornton's group in a journal called Science, they're from Rochester in New York, and from Rick Vansink and Beveringer's group in Holland. And in both cases, they have used different types of oligo to try and target the faulty RNA. Now, just to flick back, what I should say is one of the challenges for this type of approach is that RNA is actually very unstable and is difficult to work with in the laboratory because it's degraded relatively easily. And any oligonucleotide which had a similar chemistry to this would also be identified by the body and degraded. So scientists have developed novel types of short oligo sequences which are stable in the body and are not degraded by the body's natural chemicals. And each of these two studies have used an oligo with a different kind of chemistry. So in the case of the Dutch group, it's something called a 2-O-methyl modified oligo. But the important piece of work that they showed in their paper was that if they treated patient cells with this oligo, it would actually degrade the faulty RNA. So this, these bands are um, effectively fragments of RNA run on a gel, and in patients you see that they're significantly larger than, than the non-myotonic band. And what they're trying to do is to find that faulty RNA with an oligo and degrade it. And this work suggests that that is a possibility. Now, in order to get the oligo into the cells, they've had to use a chemical which partially damages the cell membrane. So that is one of the big challenges for oligo-based research, how to get the oligo into the cells. Now, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it's thought 
that the membranes of cells from Duchenne's patients are more porous and allow the oligos to pass more easily into those cells. Whereas the perception is for myotonic dystrophy that, that sh it shouldn't be that easy. Now, the work from Charles Thornton's group used a different kind of oligo, which was successful in a mouse model in that they suggested that it was that if you injected this into a mouse and then subjected the muscle to an electric shock, it would allow the oligo to enter the cells and that in so doing, it managed to overcome some of the features of, of, the, of the condition. Now, there is a lot of work under development for different types of oligochemistry. And these are just some examples. So I mentioned to you that there is the phosphate sugar backbone for the DNA and the RNA, and that then there are bases that come off those in DNA like the rungs of a ladder. And these are molecules which have been modified, chemically modified, and can be used in oligos to make a sort of artificial short chemical, short compound, which can be introduced into cells and will, importantly, be stable because they won't be degraded. Because of these sort of colored bits here, the body doesn't recognize them in the same way as the natural compounds, and therefore it doesn't degrade them. So there are different types of oligochemistry, and we've been trying to test them in our system in Nottingham. And what, we, what we've set up is a, 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 a robot which can um, put lots and lots of oligos onto lots and lots of cells. And then we've got a plate reader which we use a particular kind of um, method for visualizing the, the spots and the spots I mentioned earlier. And then we can count them and we can ask how effective is one particular type of oligo over another in the way it's able to get rid of the spots or not. Now, um, as we started this work, we found a, a publication by a group uh, which had used a, a novel method to introduce oligos into cells. Oh, sorry, Dan, could I have a glass of water? I'm struggling a little bit with that. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> so, now, there's no magic trick here, but what this group reported was that rather than having to use some chemical to um, affect the membrane of a cell to get the oligo into that cell, you could actually simply put it into the water or the media that the cell is growing in, and it would take up the oligo passively. Now that in itself is very important because what that means is if you can get the oligochemistry right, then it should be possible for these oligos to enter cells in the body, target the faulty RNA, and degrade it 
or effectively inactivate it. So we've tested a set of different oligos in our cells and scored spots. So we've asked the question, if you put in type 1 oligo, does it get rid of the spots? If you put in type 2 oligo, does it get rid of the spots? And so here are some examples of a, an oligo called a morpholino or an LNA, a lock nucleic acid, and then a 2-O-methyl oligo and a PNA, which is a peptide nucleic acid. And what we, what we found, which is shown on, on this slide, is we, we just score the number of spots present in the patient's cells and look at the effect of the oligo on the number of spots. And these are graphs which are a readout for how well a particular oligo works. And if an oligo works, it should reduce the number of spots completely. If it doesn't work, it should have no effect on the number of spots. And what this data tells us is that in our cells in culture, two particular oligochemistries, 2-O-methyl modified oligo and peptide nucleic acid, have a very significant effect on spots that they get rid of the spots, whereas the morpholinos, DNA oligos and LNAs do not seem to get rid of the spots. So that's quite interesting. We've also looked at some at the same effect in myoblasts, in muscle cells. So the cells that we've been using for most of our analysis are skin fibroblasts, which have actually been given by volunteers. I mean, one, one myotonic meeting, I think we collected 10 sets of biopsies from patients. So consider yourselves lucky. We're not going to embark on that today. But the cell lines that we've collected have been invaluable. And what this piece of data shows is that the muscle cell cultures behave in exactly the same way as the fibroblast cell cultures. So overall, this points to the fact that with these particular kinds of oligos, we can get rid of the spots from patient cells. We've, this is a little bit overcomplicated, but what this shows is that the oligos which get rid of the spots do not appear to be degrading the mutant RNA. So one good point, one bad. Good, they're getting into the cells. Good that they appear to be sticking to the RNA to block our means of, of, of visualizing them, but that is not sufficient to degrade the mutant RNA. And the latest work from people is, uh, from various groups, and we're also looking at this, is to use a, an oligo called a GAPMA, which is a sort of hybrid which it's hoped will help to stimulate the degradation of the mutant transcript. Now, we don't know for sure that it is absolutely necessary to degrade the mutant transcript. It could be beneficial to simply block it, but that's sort of ongoing work.